Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today we'll take a look at the issue devoted to the bean in Science of the Secondary, an Atlas of the Everyday by Atelier Hoco. The bean. It is well known that to remove their rubbish, human beings have long since relied on the bean. They fill it up with all sorts of garbage, and when it is more or less full and the stench becomes unbearable, one unfortunate individual will have the dreaded task of emptying it. It is curious, however, that in parts of the world untouched by man, beans are neither seen nor heard it of, and before our minds start conjuring scenes of animals burning their own garbage every night, a better explanation would be that the concept of rubbish simply does not exist in nature, and therefore no bean. Drawing beans from memory when attempting to draw a bean, an assortment of bean forms started to float into our minds. Some are familiar and almost universal, while there are others that we encounter fleetingly as we find our way around unfamiliar streets. What is a bean? Why do we need them? Do we need them? While the bean has been in our lives for many years, its definition is actually more ambiguous than we think. Almost anything can be a bean, as long as it separates rubbish from everything else. And since beans and rubbish do not necessarily bear each other out, the latter almost always outnumbering the former, there is no evidence of an increase in littering as anticipated, and neither is there a conscious effort to consume less. How then do we deal with rubbish in the absence of a bin? Habituated to a mostly sedentary lifestyle for the past decade, our body finds it increasingly hard to get up from where we have been comfortably seated, just to drop one single chocolate wrapper into a nearby bin. This resistance to move is so intense that we begin to develop ways to hold the rubbish in place, put out of sight or neatly contained. Any way to avoid making a trip to the bin is appreciated. These supposed strategies born of sheer laziness have invariably revealed the potentials of using our immediate surroundings to simulate the basic functions of a standard bin in one way or another. In this respect, almost any situation is a bin, albeit a temporary one that will be duly emptied the minute the task is accomplished or when we decide it is time to get up and go. Despite the presence of beans on the street, litter remains one of the most conspicuously appalling sights of our public spaces. It is a virulent form of evil, aggravated by the packaging industry that unloads an increasing volume of instant rubbish upon us. Yet we seem unaffected, almost as if the constant exposure to littered streets had blunted our sensitivity. To make matters worse, we excuse our behavior by claiming that certain conditions in our surroundings suggest or hint at a potential bin for which rubbish can be deposited. We are all guilty of this, flicking a speck of dust out of the window, dropping a small piece of rubbish inside a nearby bush, or casually assuming bicycle baskets and other similarly shaped objects as beans. These are obviously not beans, but their inherent likeness can sometimes sway our judgment. Is depositing rubbish here an honest mistake or blatant littering? Innumerable bean experiences are dependent on the way they are arranged around vertical structures such as walls and columns. If well placed, the bean provides every comfort for us so that using it is a happy experience. 
but this spatial consideration is deceptively complex for several reasons. First of all, what may feel quite right and natural in one room can easily be wrong in another when different habits and tasks are performed. We must therefore be aware of the general use of the bin and the typical activities around it, otherwise the bin will be either underused or in an inaccessible position and become a constant reminder of a futile collaboration between wall and bin. Transitioning, as we all do every day in our lives, has a strange way of gently reminding us to dispose of rubbish that we have in hand or collected over time. It is as if the idea of carrying rubbish from one space to another is prohibited, or at least frowned upon by some. As such, it is not uncommon to find beans near or around doorways diligently receiving rubbish as we pass. On the other hand, there are those who, whether out of habit or simply a general disdain to carry rubbish around, prefer to always have a bean within reach by utilizing pockets of emptiness that are found in the arrangement of furniture, fittings and walls. These little nooks and crannies provide a convenient pretext to squeeze a bin within for easy access, while effectively remaining out of sight until the need to use it arises. When we consider the context behind these varying bin positions, the doorway bin for transitioning and the bin by our side for prolonged stagnation, it becomes clear that each has its own purpose and reflects our daily relationship with rubbish. Should beans uh, disappear when not in use? The term use is problematic since a bean is always waiting for rubbish to enter. Amongst the many human desires that fuels our discontent, the question of how a bean should present itself must be one of the most trivial. Very few people claim to enjoy the presence of beans, and even less so when it is brightly colored. Considering how techniques of invisibility are still developing and beans are probably a very low in the need to disappear objects spectrum, it is curious how we generally do not notice the beans around us. Did they really disappear? When considered carefully, the empty air space around any bean opening is hardly neutral and passive to the act of disposal. In fact, the emptiness is equally if not more important than the bin itself, since it is where the actual separation of rubbish from hand happens. Referred to here as the drop field, it is highly functional and loyally rewards those who know how to use it. Releasing rubbish within ensures a higher chance of landing it inside the bin. Alongside our familiarity with the bin's usual positions within the interior space, recognizing and utilizing the drop field may just further enforce the bin's invisibility. There is no doubt that the generous opening of a round bin fills us with energy and the confidence to land every piece of rubbish within. The sight of its circular form stimulates the average bin user in a way that is instinctive to the act of disposal. But if we turn to examine a rectilinear bin, we will immediately realize what different sensations the shape arouses. Its narrow opening is more likely an enlarged slot and its compact form allows flexibility in positioning. While it may actually be harder to land rubbish thrown from afar, there seems to be something coherent about a rectilinear bin, an air of assurance that its curvier counterpart lacks. Among the many functions of the lowly bin is its uncanny ability to dominate the immediate space around as a temporal dumping ground. 
While most of us are aware that it is not exactly the proper way to dispose of rubbish, we continue to do so by cautiously placing rubbish within the invisible spatial demarcations prescribed by the bin and its immediate surroundings. Half convinced that by maintaining this order, one is disposing of rubbish properly and absorbed of any wrongdoing. In truth, placing rubbish around beans is not proper, but for convenience we tolerate the mess in full knowledge that it is merely temporal. Granted, the types of rubbish may also be a factor, too fragile, too hazardous, too big, too useful. But none of this alters the fact that this form of disposal is inappropriate and in fact it is worse because the same practice indoors tends to spread out to how we use public beans. Although authorities may agree that this method, at the very least, gathers rubbish around the bin, making the task of removing them easier. While it is generally agreed that the position and form of a bean can affect how we dispose of rubbish, the other condition that has influence over the entire process of disposing rubbish and our experience of the bean can be found in the variation of lids. Every time we approach the bean, we initiate a subtle negotiation with the lid to form the appropriate opening for rubbish to slip through. From lidded beans operated with one foot to the waste paper basket that is always open, every bean carries its own innate behavior. Yet, despite such diversity, we continue to view the act of disposing rubbish as one and the same. Atelier Hoko is an independent research lab that focuses on the study of the growing disengagement between people, things and space. Previous issues of Science of the Secondary are devoted to the banana, toilet paper, the plate, the egg, the apple, the door, the window, the clock, the cup. Ask for it at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next.